So what I'm going to do is, um, this is probably not a good subject to talk after lunch. Okay. This is, epidemiology is, is extremely important subject, but it's extremely boring. So like an entire um, area of research, this, I have taken out all the statistics, so I won't put you through any of this, uh, you know, uh, statistical issues or anything like that. We'll just go through the concepts of, uh, uh, we'll just go through the concepts, concepts of epidemiology, molecular epidemiology, and I want, I'll cover like one example of how epidemiology is related in, uh, in devising the, uh, the overall area of research and we'll use green tea. So green tea has been very popular and it's all based on uh, on epidemiology. So epidemiology is essentially used as the first step for identifying any new herbal uh, product or plants or spices that you want to do just on a broader scale. So most of the studies are done by uh, hearsay, folklore medicine, saying okay you know you are eating mung beans and you don't have colon cancer in this area so say okay then let's study that something this you know I mean I'm just giving hypothetical but um, that's that's the area of epidemiology epidemiology has uh, invested I mean the studies of epidemiology uh, has uh, has used a lot of National Cancer Institute money and many times one of the drawbacks is that um, once you start working on epidemiology and they're all statisticians and cancer prevention people once they start working on epidemiology and then they have to wait they have to do the research for five six years to see the result and even though they know that nothing is going to pan out the government has to keep on putting money because they have already invested so much money to work a million dollars to do one more year of statistics so that's, that's how it happens. But uh, that, that's just uh, you know, besides the point. But let's go through some of the epidemiological concepts so that you will have some idea about about epidemiology. I think so it comes right. Okay. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the epidemiology, uh, the whole of okay. So epidemiology is, so this is what we all know, it's a study of how disease is distributed in population and the factors that influence this dis determination of, uh, uh, of distribution. So for example, uh, a lot of people here are working on, uh, on thiols or thio, thio related compounds. So what happens is there is a town in uh, near San Francisco uh, Palo Alto called Victoria, Victoria, California. So they grow world's largest amount of garlic. So there you can get like you know garlic fest, you can get garlic ice cream, you can get everything garlic. And I went to visit my friend and his uh, house that he built, you smell garlic in the house because the whole plant is there, you know like in the city. So now garlic is related, it's volatility and it's aromatism. It's related to decreasing cancer of lung, for example, because when a compound is volatile and aromatic, the first thing that is going to reach is lungs, because you're going to breathe it, and the lung is the primary target for that. So they did the survey, and they found that well, Victoria has a low, a lower amount of lung cancer as compared to other counties in California. So that's how the whole epidemiology sort of works. Now, you, have a, you, you can describe the distribution and size of this, uh, disease problems in the human population, meaning what is the incidence, how many people in that area get cancer as compared to the area where they don't have this type of uh, things. One of the best examples that has come out in the literature over the years is, a, uh, is one of the provinces in China where the soil is selenium deficient and the the things that grow there and people who eat food or anything there they have a very high incidence of 
gastric cancer, colon cancer, stomach cancer, whereas the other provinces don't have it. So then they correlate that, that okay, selenium may have this effect. So now in that province, it, it, it so happened that they started fortifying the soil with selenium to see if the, and that becomes that the uh, study in itself to compare to the previous population. So it's all epidemiological research, right? So that elucidates the, the etiology of disease. That how disease is cancer? Is it because of the deficiency of something? Or maybe you are getting something that provides, provides the protection. Now there are subcategories. There is the descriptive epidemiology, correlative epidemiology, analytical epidemiology and molecular epidemiology. And little later when I go through that, I'll go through each one of them as to how it correlates in relation to real life. That what is the descriptive epidemiology, what type of studies or the answers can be derived from that or from molecular epidemiology and so on. Okay, so for example, this is, a, this is a, one of the very early examples as we talked about that human exposure, which in, I said in the previous lecture, you get the scrotal cancer. So now your correlation is well whether there is something in the chimney uh, ashes that has any carcinogenic activity that causes a scrotal cancer. Then they'll say, okay, does it also cause the colon cancer or does it have any effect on breast cancer? So people will take it a step further. But that's how the epidemiological it was derived. Cigarette smoking and lung cancer is a huge issue and that is very well established and I'll show you some pictures of that. But uh, the, the lung cancer and cigarette smoking is totally epidemiologically based that you have. The reproductive factors and breast cancer, we'll be talking about this when I talk about hormones and the occupational aromatic amines and, uh, and bladder cancer. So descriptive type, uh, epidemiology, if you look at the incidence, you are talking about two things there. You look at the incidence of a disease. So incidence of a disease is always measured per thousand. Right? So number of new cases in a population is during the specified period of time, like one year, how many new tumor incidences occurred in last year as compared to the number of people at risk of developing disease. So in other words, how many people were staying in that area, they were all at risk, for example, and then how many people developed cancer. That's how it becomes the incidence. Incidence is a measure of risk. The another the major one is the prevalence, that how, how much, how the population is affected, uh, how many numbers of people are affected in that, that area. So there what we do is that, that again you measure in a specific time, so within a given time per thousand, how many people uh, have the disease as compared to people, how many people didn't have the disease, or number of people that, that were there in the population. So, so those two terms, whether not mutually exclusive, they they have they depend on each other, incidence and prevalence. But there is some minor difference in them. Okay. So statistics, we know that ep epidemiology is really hardcore statistics because they have a lot of problems in uh, in really analyzing the data. It's all analytical epidemiology. You uh, can. Uh, uh, you can really make some sort of association. Association, as I showed in the first slide, meaning that, you know, uh, something happened and the result came out to be something different. So, sometimes it can be misled, you know, for, uh, that means uh, a crow sitting on a branch and, and the crow falls because the branch breaks. So that also may mean that if the crow sits on a branch, the branch is going to fall. But so, so the epidemiology can be very misleading sometimes. So you have to really see what you are, you know, what you are measuring. Uh, these are va various, and these slides are going to be in your brochure. I'm not going to go through this slide. Because all this slide says that if you ever want to do statistics of your research, not just for epidemiology, but there are, there are so many places that will analyze your data uh, as a, you know, as a service. So you provide them with your data, like National Cancer Institute does it, 
there are many institutes, CEDF, they do the epidemiological data analysis, the CDC does lots of analysis, so there are a lot of them. So if you ever have to do that, there are a lot of statistical institutes that will do the service for free. Uh, <coughs> what type of data can be analyzed from that thing? So these kind of graphs were generated by American Cancer Society and many other organizations where they uh, say that, okay, for example, this one is talking about the lung cancer uh, in relation to the tobacco use. It's a World Health Organization report and you can see where, where there is the most prevalence of cigarette smoking and it also correlates with the, with the lung cancer incidence. In India, we have a, uh, a lot of lung cancer problem that is because of unfiltered. Now people are uh, you know, not using as many BDs as they used to, but uh, there was a time when a cigarette was really upscale smoking and most people who cannot afford were smoking, you know, BDs. So it's better not to smoke, but if you smoke, just don't smoke the unfiltered, uh, unfiltered thing. And United States, although if you look at the total number, there are a lot of lung cancer cases, but they are not as compared to the uh, the other uh, uh, other countries. If you look at the uh, uh, annual uh, cancer incidence overall. You can see that in the men, in, in these are United States data, by the way, is the uh, it's more prevalent amongst men as compared to women, and the mortality is also very high in uh, men as compared to women. The important thing to see in here is the trend. The trend is declining. In other words, with all the cancer prevention, the new strategies that are coming up non-smoking has a, you know, there is a big push for having no smoking. In United States, we have the uh, towns or cities, they are becoming smoke-free. So in other words, not just the, in the entire United States, all the buildings are smoke-free. You have to go outside to smoke. You cannot smoke in the building or in any public place or airports or, or anywhere like that. So that has, that has really helped. So that shows clearly that the incidence is related uh, to the habits that, that people have. If you, if you give up that part, it can be, it can be changed. I'll tell you a funny story also in a second, which just occurred to me. Uh, this is the incidence uh, for all the comparison for men and women of different types of tumors. You have the more, this uh, estimated death. You have lung cancer is ranked at the highest. In men, second is prostate cancer and women is the breast cancer as expected. Colon is similar in both. And, uh, and then you can just go through this. This slide will be in your brochure if you have any interest. But this, this is sort of self-explanatory. The only thing it says that again the lung cancer is the major, major issue. Although breast cancer is uh, is observed more often amongst women, uh, you know, throughout the world, but the rate of survival or the occurrence uh, is better for breast cancer than than for the lung cancer. Lung cancer is still a, is a big killer. Uh, these are the different types of cancer survival rate. Now, skin has the least amount. Uh, because most of them are treatable, you can see it, they can, physician can remove it and then uh, usually don't metastasize or anything like that. Uh, breast cancer is not bad and the reason for this is um, the early detection. The early detection has helped so much that the breast cancer incidence just keep on going uh, down. So in other words, they are, they are identified very early and not, uh, not really a threat. The worst one is pancreas. Pancreas has still not been uh, attacked well. There are lots of new drugs that are coming up in the market or also in the uh, pipeline of many industries, many universities and research labs, but none of them have really made a stride to say that, okay, like tamoxifen was for breast cancer or you know, paroxy came for colon cancer. If you had something for pancreatic cancer, that would be great, but they still don't have anything like that. 
Okay, this is the uh, different types of uh, uh, reasons uh, the deaths occur. You have the uh, heart attack, right? And then accident and everything else is pressed in here, right? Okay, I'll read it in, in here. You have the traffic accidents, return of fear, and the HIV, and the stroke, and heart disease. And then if you look at the cancer, cancer right now is very similar to heart attack, but it's going to take take over its projection is for uh, between 2002 and 2030. So the, uh, the things is that the cancer is going to be a, a major, major killing, uh, killing part. HIV uh, uh, related uh, autoimmune diseases are going down because they have started having really good cures and they have made a lot of strides. Now, you know, a lot of uh, effort is also being made at like, uh, uh, you know, Alzheimer's disease and things like that. And, and that takes some money away from cancer research because they have to distribute the, uh, the cost. Uh, in India, if you compare India versus USA, we have a huge big cancer, uh, total number of cancers as compared to what, what India has. But then if you select the cancer by type or organ, then some organs have more in, in India as compared to the United States and United States have many, have many other types that are more. This is it. This is one of the best slides that that epidemiology has provided. I took it from some book. Now, this is a lung cancer where epidemiology really works. For example, the epidemiological uh, things they have started collecting data when at the time of World War. When at the time of World War, people started smoking a lot. Smoking had become really a big uh, like a fashion or everybody was smoking during the during the uh, world war time and so this is the smoking cigarette consumption kept on going up since then uh, all the way and then if you look at 20 years later the cancer incidence almost parallels so there's a there's a clear sign that the co correlation of uh, the cigarette smoke and cancer is uh, is very important. Now, one of the questions that's going to come in your mind, and uh, I probably don't have an answer for, is is the one that uh, what about people who smoke and don't get cancer? There are right. That's that's an obvious question. So why would that happen? So there are there are no real answers for that. The answer, one of the things that, that we can see is the, is the food habit, the anime, the person's, uh, you know, uh, ability to, uh, to have the, uh, DNA repair system in, in action from the, uh, P53 codons or things that are not, that are the mutations that are known to cause the, uh, the lung cancer. Maybe they are very intact in some people who, so I know so many people and they, they ask me in my class all the time that my grandfather smoked cigarette all his life, never left a cigarette in his hand, right? And still has no cancer and you know, I mean, that's a good thing he doesn't have cancer, but I really, I don't think anybody really has a clear vision or clear reason about not, you know, not having cancer. So, right? you had a question? Yeah, no? I was just thinking, this is the most effective disease. Our genomes are, uh, our genes, some of our genes. That's, that's exactly what I said. So for example, you know, you, yeah, that's exactly what I said. So there's some DNA repair enzymes and things like that which are clearly connected to uh, the DNA damage or the um, uh, mutation systems or the metabolites that are connected to uh, to the smoking, uh, like carcinogen processing, for example, from cigarettes, that may have a um, that may have something to do with it. Now, what happens is, I'll tell you a funny story. So, for example, in uh, where I work, we have inhalation chambers. Inhalation chambers are well-controlled particle-sized chambers at my institute, and we have inhalation department. They work on this uh, project. They had a project, a multi-million dollar project for many years from Philip Morris, which is a cigarette company. 
And so what they were doing was they were going through 100,000 cigarettes a year. So, and the machine is made in such a way that the this, this cigarette comes down, gets lit up automatically, the rats are inside, they let smoke cigarette, right? So the smoke, then this, but when the cigarette is gone, the, cig, the you know, finished cigarette falls off, second one comes on, hooks up, so you can program it how many cigarettes you want, say, you know, and a <laughs> day and things like that. Okay, they get cancers. And uh, so then, then the study was, that, okay, what happens if you take, if you don't give them after the cans, after, uh, you know, some time. So that, the rats who were exposed to smoking, and then they took them out of smoking. They, they took the smoke out and lived a normal life. Well, those are the ones they you know, they don't do too well. So, so I don't know how well it correlates, but uh, those are the type of things that the experiments have to be done. More epidemiology has to be done. So in terms of human, that you are smoking, you are you are chain smoker, and and the, everybody says that, okay, quit smoking and it should be okay. But you know that that always works. You know, the, I mean, you can you can quit any time. It's always helpful, and but in this experimental condition, there must be some sort of a uh, difference between the rat system and the human system. That in rats, it just you know does not work quite as well. Okay, so this is another very good example. This is one of the best examples that they have in epidemiology. It's very old but very true. So, for example, this is a breast cancer incident in American women from San Francisco area. Okay, so old slide was very powerful, and this is the incidence of Japanese women in Japan. So, very low incidence of cancer, breast cancer in Japanese women in Japan. Now, this is the Japanese women moved to San Francisco. So. So now when we talk about saying that the food habits have a lot to do with cancer occurrence or cancer prevention, this is a true example. But Japanese women, their food habit in Japan, which is a uh, you know, lot of seaweed, seaweed soups and you know, a lot of um, uh, fish and you know, things like that, as compared to uh, you know red meat and lot of beef and steaks and things like that, that, that cancer incidence goes up dramatically. And this hasn't gone down. This is not one time effect. It always remains like that. So this this was, this this is something that we really should keep in mind that food habits are very important in terms of uh, cancer. So when you look at the association, you have a specific factor like high fat diet, cigarette smoking, selenium deficient diet, vitamin D deficient diet, something, whatever you have, that's your factor. Now that's going to change your, this is going to provide an altered uh, state, disease state. Or you are at a high risk of developing cancer up here and then you move somewhere where your food habits change, then that factor is going to decrease your risk of developing cancer down the road. Now, one theory in carcinogenesis says that all of us are initiated. All of us are prone to have cancer, but uh, you, you don't live long enough to have cancer. So in other words, they say that if everybody, if you do a lifetime study on a rat uh, after giving carcinogen at a very early stage, 100% incidence will occur. In, in, in all the animals will get cancer. So if, if the animal lifespan is three years and you let it go till they die, then the best cancer prevention study is that. Very expensive. But what you do is you keep on providing them cancer preventive agents and you have a control. Let every animal die. Okay? Till, till natural death. Don't no killing. Natural death and then you measure the incidence of cancer, uh, then you can really very uh, you know, confidently say that, okay, uh, this compound is, is very good. 
I give an example. In the literature, I come across this all the time because I'm an editor of some journals. So a paper will come and there is a study done and they killed all the animals at two months. Because, I, mean, I know, I can, I can see it through. <laughs> Then you know what happened is start, the animals started getting tumors in the in the treatment group. So they say, okay, let's stop them. So they go up to that far, so they have a difference, right? If they keep on going, both the groups are going to merge. So that's what happens. So in other words, when you uh, ethically do a study, you have to do it properly to make sure that, uh, you know, that the study is going to give you good results uh, or interpretable results. And don't shy away if the result is not good. Well, everything doesn't have to work. So, alternatively, what you have to do, like everybody does, like all of us do, and I'm sure all of you guys do, is that we decide the time up front. That I'm going to let the study go 180 days. Okay? It's not that if the tumors start coming, I'll kill them. Like, you know, on 39 days or something like that. You just have to let this go six months and be done with it, find your results. And then you interpret your data. Maybe you'll get a trend line. Maybe there is a difference, large difference in between. So you can supplement or do something else. So the way to do it is that that's your altered state. So you have a, you have observation, you have statistical validation, as I told you, and then you can do the geological analysis whether this factor is responsible for the tumor outcome that you're looking for. So that's, that's the whole essence of it. So I, I saw this and I really liked that. The epidemiological is funny thing. It said that okay, you do the, they do the epidemiologists do the the uh, questionnaire. So it says, well, as I recall correctly, on April 17, 1991, at 6:37, I ate uh, salmon steak and some rice and some broccoli, and this was done for in year 2000. So in other words, they ask you a question. What's your food? Okay, what did you eat? Did you did you eat some uh, you know meal? Did you have protein in there? And they take this history three months ago or four, I don't know what I ate yesterday. So I mean, no, it's just that's that's where epidemiology gets a lot of criticism that the questionnaires they provide are so uh, untrue sometimes. Many of them are very good because some people have a regular habit. That this is what I eat every day, that's it, nothing else, aloo parotta every day in the morning, that's it. Then you can tell something that, okay, there is a, there is an issue. But if somebody, you know, a person like me, it's not, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to give you an accurate, uh, accurate profile, uh, profile for this. So the other thing they do is many times, which is really good for metabolism profiles, is they have, uh, at, at our place, they, they get the students and have them drink like tomato juice. This lady was working on tomato juice. Whether they want it or not, they have to drink like three glasses of tomato juice every day in the morning. <laughs> so and then they try to profile the liver enzyme profile and then they have control that they did not give. So studies like that are good. Those are very straightforward, but some, some studies have, have inherent problems. Okay. This slide is not, I was going to cover prevention later on. So I'm not going to. Now, when you do any epidemiological study, odds ratio, all your data are correlated with something called odds ratio. Odds ratio you have to determine and there is a formula for that. So you do any epidemiological study, any trend line, does not have to be epidemiological study. You are comparing something in a large population a food or uh, any event or exposure to uh, pollution and you do anything and in, you have to measure the odds ratio. So what's the odds ratio? It, odds ratio looks at the probability of a certain event whether it's the same in two groups. People who are exposed, people who are not exposed. So the odds ratio of one will imply that, that this event is equal in both groups. So if you have an odds ratio greater than one, that will imply that that event is more likely to occur in the first group and odds ratio of less than one is uh, event is going to be less likely to occur in, in the first group. Meaning if you are comparing control versus a treatment group, if you are 
and you're looking at a cancer preventive agent and if your odds ratio is less than one that means that compound is good and this this shows the proof of principle all the time if you have odds ratio calculated you show your data with odds ratio people are going to believe you as to you know that that that's pretty good okay now we won't go through the other other calculations but if you look at the odds ratio the way you calculate and this slide is in your brochure so you can go through that but this is how you calculate it's a very simple calculation exposed cases and non exposed control versus non exposed cases and exposed control the ratio of that will give you an odds ratio odds ratio 1 and then you have the uh, uh, greater than 1 or less than 1 and then you can <coughs> you can really have the uh, the risk factor analyzed uh analyzed for the uh, for this okay now molecular epidemiology so what happens is that this epidemiology that i was uh, kind of giving you some some out background on was done very like a old fashioned one although it's done now but now the all the epidemiological studies that are designed or conducted they are matched up with the molecular epidemiology molecular epidemiology is very good because what that's going to do is you it's going to have a biomarker analysis so it still is a, you have exposure to something and you get cancer you don't know why it happened right we just that's that's a traditional epidemiology traditional epidemiology you look at the exposure you measure the outcome you don't care what happen in between okay now the molecular epidemiology is going to measure the internal dose how much is absorbed how much is in your system what's going on what's the metabolism what's the biologically effective dose what's the uh, alter structure function you look at your you know analytical anal doing analytics on those and see that and that see if it forms a preclinical disease and it gives you a cancer and so on and so this one is <coughs> what analytic what altered structure or function that you get is going to give you a susceptibility figure and that's going to determine uh, early markers bio biochemical markers your molecular uh, epidemiological uh, uh, signature so you have bunch of genes that say okay if you measure this four genes you can determine you can say that okay i know i'm going this uh, this is very uh, cancer susceptibility gene or you can have in prevention that okay if you measure the uh, certain genes and say that these genes are the ones that are related to suppress the decrease the incidence of cancer then those are your uh, your genes that you uh, you call them as molecular epidemiological epidemiology and the way you relate them is used in the population so you have large population just like epidemiology and then you have measurements of these uh, these events that are occurring so epidemiology evaluates the distribution and determines of disease in population with ultimate goal of prevention the obviously the reason for epidemiology is done in cancer field is to prevent disease that if you find the etiological cause then you can try to eliminate that if you find the uh, event that prevents cancer then you have a compound or 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 a product natural product or whatever it is uh, that that suppresses cancer now molecular epidemiology it incorporates molecular genetics which means genomics cell biology which means you can have immunohistochemistry of of uh, you know certain uh, uh, certain proteins within uh, you know binding to receptors or what not you can have uh, immunohistochemistry done immunofluorescence done stuff like that biochemistry uh, you can have the metabolic the metabolic profiles you can have statistical bioethics uh, all this is done now bioethical processing is also very important sometimes you know like taking certain organs or processing in in united states you to get a sample from a hospital for your work is nearly impossible 
they have to go through the IRBs, you have to good connections, you have to like, you know, it's, uh, it's lot of red tap to, to get, uh, get the samples for work. Even for collaborators, even for physicians, it's not that, that simple. And then molecular dosimetry. So molecular epidemiology will also include molecular dosimetry. That is what is the internal dose that is biologically effective. Uh, that uh, and then that that is it's very similar to uh, all of you are doing in this department as to looking at the uh, you know the chemistry or the, uh, the biochemical profiling of uh, uh, you know of the dosimetry uh, susceptibility studies uh, that those are the ones where uh, if, if there is any um, any, any genetic changes genetic variants that are uh, that that have a disease relationship so let me give you an example for example the jewish people or parsis in uh, our parsi community uh, in gujarat they have a uh, higher brca metabolism brca1 metabolism so what happens is that many jewish uh, women or I do, Parsi also I had a, we, I, did, I don't a research proposal, didn't get funded, I mean you know, many of them don't get funded which I write, but uh, the, uh, the writing in collaboration with somebody that there is a, uh, there is a whole big Parsi community in the United States and they follow the data on them. So what uh, we wanted to do is to measure BRCA expression, mutation expression in those women and see what's the susceptibility or what's getting the or the cancer rate. So where it is used for example the BR, BRCA uh, if you see the expression of BRCA mutation and there now the kits are available. So people, the physicians can prescribe a kit, measure the BRCA expression and then can say that well okay you are at a higher risk or not of developing cancer. That is good and bad. It is uh, it's good because you know that you are at a higher risk of developing cancer. But what do you do? Like for example, if you are a BRCA carrier, then you know. Then what happens? That uh, what do you do? Do you do, you do the prevention? Whether you know whether you do the start taking tamoxifen and heavy duty drugs up front or with the mastectomy or whatever many of them do and then uh, then nothing might happen right so that's a risk so that's not good so my, I mean, that's a very questionable issue I, I always was saying that and there is no sense in doing the in doing the BRCA <coughs> analysis But the uh, but from the from the from the academics point of view, that's how it works. That you need to have the uh, BRCA1. There are many of many such uh, genes for colon cancer. There one, there are MSH2 for some other uh, DNA repair. There's several of them. Those susceptibility genes that people come up with. BRCA1 and 2 are the most important ones. Okay. So uh, when do we do the study on the animal study? So you have the cancer epidemiology. Based on that, the selenium, selenium is lack of selenium causes esophageal cancer. So or end of cancer, I'm just giving you an example. So it's okay, I'll do the animal study. I'll have a chemical carcinogenesis model, I'll put in selenium and see what happens. So when you do that, then you know the selen uh, you know, like selenium, the acetate form of it is highly toxic. The animals are going to get killed. So medicinal chemists or synthetic chemists are going to synthesize 15 different analogs and see which one is less toxic, whether it is active. So there's a lot of work done on selenium in the United States, not anymore. And the reason it's not done was the United States spent huge amount of money on a selenium uh, trial, epidemiological trial. And the result came out after 10 years and so many tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, I forget the number I used to remember, 
the the outcome came out that was there was no correlation so things things like that happen right and then you have the you measure the molecular dosimetry of carcinogen you see how much is what is your internal dose you look at the inherited cancer this predisposition like BR, brca or things like that there also gives you the hazard identification if it is a um, uh, say for example if it is uh, exposure in say in united states we have a lot of pollution control but if you go on some expressways you have a lot of diesel exhaust because like you know a lot of traffic if you go to india in any city you have huge amount of pollution china you cannot breathe china you don't see the sun during the really sunny day because because of pollution so those happen and that gives you some sort of a hazard identification that okay you know i really I should not do that or, or wear the mask or do something like that and the exposure assessment all these fall under molecular epidemiological studies so okay we want to that and here is a good example of the environmental carcinogens that uh, that lots of people or all of us are more or less exposed to in the uh, uh, you know in, in in big cities okay so many biomarkers using bio by using this uh, thing are already established so there are so many markers they have already been established for example aflatoxin dna adduct you measured in urine or liver and that will give you the risk uh, for liver cancer uh, the uh, poly uh, aryl hydrocarbon has uh, dna adduct in blood have also been used for for this thing and this slide is also in your brochure so i won't go each one uh, in detail but this one is sort of important because p53 is a suppressor gene and i had lots of slides i took them out because we're not going to be able to have time to go through them but p53 has lots of areas that has mutation and those mutations are really correlated with having tumor so the measurement of p53 mutation uh, can give you a good indication of a of a molecular marker for the for the cancer type and this is the uh, these are some of the uh, mutations in p53 occurring if you have aflatoxin as a carcinogen which is a, causes liver cancer there is a on 249 code on you have c g to c or t2a tobacco smoke uh, bladder cancer lung cancer you have this in this uh, this code on and then your vinyl chloride and your sarcoma which is uh, in the uh, getting the, the transversal in p53 antibody so study of p53 has been so extensively done in literature that probably the if you look at one single gene that has lots and lots of studies that have been done then you see in p53 because uh, uh, the, the mutation is going to be a problem in, in, in one or the one or the other diseases aflatoxin i'll talk about it more but aflatoxin you you get it in uh, in molded pe peanuts like for example remember we always used to uh, cut the top off before we eat peanuts so the little little thing on the top we people take it off and they eat because uh, because they didn't know why but the whole thing was that that is where the moldy part occurs which causes the liver cancer because that has aflatoxin and you did don't need much of aflatoxin to cause liver cancer very little will do the trick so tobacco smoke of course we know tobacco smoke also has like 300 different compounds in them so if you look at uh, the you know uh, the ability of some sort of isolated compound to cause tumor you may run into a brick wall so there you have to use like a whole tobacco smoke or the whole whole food right okay some genes this is cytochrome p450 a gene 
that have been uh, associated because you can have the you, many genes have polymorphisms. The minor changes within the gene profiling make huge big changes. We worked on polymorphism of vitamin D receptor and only a minor change, for example, uh, in, in, a, in a gene, the f this one amino acid or three amino acids are less, so the initiation site for transcription changes by like, you know, two or three amino acids because the first ATG comes like a little bit late. So that's going to give you a different protein. And that protein is going to be responsible for high or low incidence of memory carcinogenesis. We did the studies, my student got PhD on that. I'll show you a, show you some data later on. And then your SIP genes play a role in the estrogen, uh, metabolism estrogen making. So for example, the, uh, when you have the, the the compound, the for, for example, the uh, there's only one step conversion that makes estrogen, and that's aromatase from testosterone to estradiol is made by aromatase. Aromatase is regulated by by CYP19 gene, so CYP19 uh, can make a huge big difference. One of my students, Akash, did uh, his whole uh, uh, PhD on aromatase and CYP19, so. We, we have people have a lot of data on that and then you know we published in uh, in really good journal uh, his work so uh, because that is relevant to the, uh, to the thing that I'll talk about it in later uh, later on is uh, the, that the aromatase is the, is the enzyme that converts testosterone to estradiol you have a lot of estradiol there so you try to find aromatase inhibitor so you have to look at the CYP19 regulation and you prevent the aromatase inhibitor. So if there is no aromatase, there is no estradiol, there is no breast cancer. Okay. Now 21 gene profile is a marker um, that's used in breast cancer. Now it does not really have any relevance to regular epidemiology but molecular epidemiology has. But I was talking to uh, the pathologist uh, uh, earlier today and he says that we cannot do it in, in, in India because that costs one and a half lakhs of rupees for one sample to do. In United States it's done routinely. So what they do is when they do the uh, 21 gene profile they have a chip and they do the PCR and look at the expression of 21 genes in a sample and then they'll come up with a recurrence score and the recurrence score will tell them the uh, that you are at a what risk of developing breast cancer or how much advanced how much you know whether it's this metastatic how, how much advanced it is. so that is that is many people use that and these are some of the some of the genes like for example your BRCA I was talking to you about the uh, mutations in BRCA or some these are DNA repair genes or that so these genes are I will see in your brochure again I, I won't go through all I'm trying to say is that many of these genes are used as as molecular epidemiological uh, standouts that people use in the in the literature or in the cleaning to identify okay so I'm going to finish at what, 2.15? Uh, oh, I mean 3.15? 3, okay. It's already... Oh, 10 minutes. Oh, okay. I have to sprint. Okay, here we go. Now I go fast, okay? If you have any questions, ask me. So, what we do is the, how this epidemiology that I explained works in real terms with nutrition. So I'll take one example and follow it through and I'll, I'll try to do it as fast as I can. Okay, so what happens is we have two kinds of prevention. We have prevention with chemicals or prevention with dietary prevention and there is an overlap. So there is a whole food concept going on right now saying that the isolated compound by itself may not be sufficient because it's the whole food that's important and the because you are isolating a compound 
from there and I'm as guilty as anybody else. But that may not be good because the example is curcumin. Curcumin in uh, turmeric, in haldi. So what happens is the curcumin is not absorbed. So you incubate cells or give to the animal, the, uh, this is not absorbed. It stays outside. So the results that you see with uh, turmeric, where you know you have a lot of papers of swelling and cancer and all that, that was that's correlated with curcumin. So people started doing hundreds of studies with curcumin. As in in, in the animal, there is a enzyme that would convert curcumin to a you know, usable form and gets absorbed. In human, it's not that. In human, it doesn't do that. So what happens is that uh, my good friend uh, Agarwal uh, Bharat in, uh, in, in Texas, a uh, huge big uh, proponent of, uh, of this thing, is Professor Ramy Anderson. And he recently found that if you have the whole food, like whole healthy, then it has a ability to convert curcumin into the active form. That's a cur Haldi works, curcumin doesn't work. So that the whole food concept is very important. And isolated compounds or combinations we need to do. And those kind of things are, are, are up in the upcoming. Uh, everything you read is not true because this one you can, you know, it's in a brochure. Like for example, some are positive things, some are negative for the same compound in the literature, in the newspaper. Somebody will say vitamin D is great, somebody will say vitamin doesn't do anything, things like that. So anything you read, you don't yeah, need. Yes. That's true. So what happened? Not in the not in India only. In the United States, we had a prostate cancer project uh, where we were going to give normal people, healthy people, vitamin D. So we divided them into two groups. One group group was going to get the vitamin D like regular vitamin D, okay, not like uh, you know, 25 hydroxy D3, which is the first form, which is non-toxic. So, and the one with the control. So for that, we had to measure the vitamin D levels in, in people before we distribute them into various groups. Because we wanted to see if the vitamin D deficient people eat this one, whether the level comes up to normal. So that was a very small study. And what happened was 80% of the people we measure vitamin D in, they're all deficient. So vitamin D deficiency is a major, major problem worldwide. And vitamin D is very good for your, you know, for health. And the vitamin D deficiency is better than the calcium will not be That's right. And that is why the energy of vitamin D and also those who are in the So, as she said, that's why the studies that have always worked is calcium plus vitamin D combination. That's how they that's how they study, and that 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 is the uh, that is the reason. It's really surprising that there is a vitamin D deficiency here in 94 degree weather, yeah. because you know uh, in Chicago we have to stay inside during the snow, whereas uh, here you guys can go out. Inside. So the thing is then, I'm going to, I, I'll uh, wrap up in about 10 minutes, okay? So the um, unanswered basic question is what compounds are essential, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow or day after tomorrow and the scientific rationale for which diet to use epidemiological analysis, food press processing, fortification, how uh, harmful that is, uh, nutritional biochemistry, what happens in the, the biochemical changes of diet uh, is it relates to health and what kind of cancer preventive agents we identify. We won't go into this because we will have, this one has what are bad, bad diet. Okay. That's what I have doing. Okay, this, this is from one of my papers, which shows that more than half of the Americans take uh, dietary pills 
and they have a still better concept. It's a 23 billion dollar industry. These are all some of the compounds that people are eating. I mean, the food in the United States. And I have given what they do. Some of them are apoptotic. Some of them are, you know, growth inhibitory. Some of them are P53 and these are things like that. But they are all available in the market. Whether they all work, strong scientific data are not available. And in United States, there is a rule that if it's derived from a herbal, from natural product, then you can market it. It doesn't have to go through FDA. So that's the reason these, all these people come up and and put their stores. So if you find some, you know, some come some herb, make a peel and put it in U.S. market. You don't have to you don't have to wait for funding. <laughs> Good, right. This this site shows me. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Patanjali. <laughs> so all these things are, uh, you know, uh, showing you what is correlated with uh, cancer death. I'm going to go quickly to show you one this study, okay? And then we'll close. Give me five minutes. So. The, the epidemiological, how it is important. So if you look at the ecological studies, the science of relationship between organisms and their environment. Okay? So if you here, if you look, then in China, this uh, green tea, we're going to talk about green tea only, one green tea. Because it's been correlated that well, in China it was said that it's been increased esophageal cancer with the, with the green tea. Now here, if you look at this, that uh, there are many reports on, on green tea and cancer. Epidemiological studies were done and it was shown that it's inhibitory for many cancer types. Stomach, pancreas, colon, lung, uh, etc. Okay, so the epidemiological study showed that green tea is, uh, is good for you. But then there's one study that showed that well, it showed negative effects. Now, so what happens in epidemiological studies, once you do the questionnaire type of studies, the simple study, then you do a case control study. So the case control study is, is the past exposure, the questionnaires. So what are the past exposures and uh, that has some bias as to people may not give you good history, they may not give you good questionnaires. So here you go that in, in one of the case control studies of green tea and breast cancer, they had about, uh, they, they followed them for about a year and about, uh, you know, women of a large range and there were 109,000 people who got, you know, got the uh, uh, control and they got the green tea, they, matched, they, they measured the green tea consumption of them and from the breast cancer clinic with no history of breast cancer, they had breast cancer patients no breast cancer patient controls, right? The conclusion was that green tea consumption was associated with reduced risk of breast cancer. And those response duration is... Uh, so I don't have time to go, but it is a lot of things. How many times poor people will use the same green tea, boil it five times? Well, the very rich people will just do it one time and throw it out. So they get more EGCG, epigallocatogen, calad than people who are poor, right? So those things are not considered in all, all this kind of study. So if you look at the odds ratio, I want to show this site for odds ratio. That when you have the consumption, more the consumption, the odds ratio is better. So that means it's protecting. That's the data, that's how they correlate the data. Okay. If you look at the cohort study, they, what is, what is, what is cohort study, cohort study, you have a, case control, for example, you know, in, in a group of healthy people and this is outcome, so that's even prospectively. And uh, in a cohort study, there was a cohort study done and you can follow and they did not found association between green tea and the, and the gastric cancer. They required a lot of patients, lots of money, 26,000 patients in China. Uh, with a, uh, you know, questionnaires, with the selected people, they adjusted for age, sex, history, and all that, practical search, alcohol consumption. So that's one thing, they have to decide what is the right population or study group uh, to include. 
Uh, they have compound called epicalocatechin GALAC, EGCG, and the 200 compound, but out of that, uh, only few are in working, uh, which are which are protective. Now that also depends preparation method, temperature of the tea, how many times it's used, how it's related, the brewing time. So there are a lot of factors that go in which people have to consider. And when you more factors consider, the better journal will take your paper. Otherwise, they'll say, okay, no, you didn't do this. Okay. Now, in the animal studies, uh, we'll talk about the you know, different different, uh, different uh, models later on, but uh, they have the, the, all the genomics is done, toxicity is done for green tea. These are the compounds, these four are the most effective ones, epigallocatechin gallate, epicatechin, 3 gallate, and so on. So some of them are uh, uh, working, EGTG is the best one. And then you can work with cell lines and look at the effects of, uh, of this compound. The compound was originally identified by, uh, by a guy named Fujiki uh, in Japan. Uh, this is pretty old, uh, old now, but he, you know, he used to, he was a big techno you know, prevention guy. I, I had gone presented the word. Here send me EGCG, uh, which, which, I, which I used but did not publish. And they are used in the beverage and all. It became very popular in the United States. And then you have to do the randomized clinical trials. There are lots of clinical trials in the USA are going on for, for green tea and they are all ongoing. Okay. So, I'm not going to talk about that one. And so oh, here I want to just show that epidemiology, the select trial, last, like last year, about six months ago, it came out that the select trial failed. Had <laughs> no four years. They spent $175 million on that. So it's, it's a lot of money. But uh, that's how, you know, that's how the epidemiological studies go. Right? So that's your epidemiological dose. And I what it says, diet contain, uh, I don't remember the something. Cook for three minutes or wait 30 years to discover if contaminated ingredient gave you stomach cancer. Meaning it's a study like, you know, you wait for perspective. Any questions? This is more like a, uh, this is more like straightforward. No, like a uh, yeah, yeah. The black tea has a comp. They doesn't have a EGCG. Epigallocatechin gallate they don't have, but they have a compound called CF Levin. So CF Levin is also active, not as active as EGCG, but there are there are numerous papers on uh, on on CF Levin. Uh, yeah. Because I think that the green tea probably when they dry and all that, maybe the EGCG gets inactivated or there is no EGCG found in black tea. But CF Levin, there is a lot of work. And in MMOC, I'll show you MMOC. I'll use all these compounds in MMOC, just so I remember them. That the CF Levin was active, but EGCG is more active. The, this biomarker that I was showing you, how do you get it to the diagnosis? Okay, so it's very easy. So for example, for the labs it's easy, right? Because labs are going to establish uh, your own, it does not have to go through any scrutiny. You decide that, okay, this is very good biomarker and you want to introduce in your in your clinic, where you are, you know, in your clinic or the physicians that you're working with. So you, you first do the test, you establish its validity, you look at this, see hypothetically, you're looking at a, a stomach cancer, 
and you're looking at a certain codon mutation. So what happens is that you can measure the P53, uh, you get the primers that are normal primer, you get the mutated primer, you look at the mutator primer, uh, you look at the expression level, if a sample has a much more expression of the mutated, that so particular. Your mutation is already found. The only thing, uh, in clinic I can go and approach a clinic and say that this is possible. You can do it, yeah. But other than that, is there a government way by which we can introduce this to every clinic? Uh, that, that your point is in, in India what's the system I don't know. So for example, you know, in the United States what they will do is they'll just publish papers. But then this type of things, what happens is people do the patterns, right? So for example, you say that okay, this mutation is a good marker for this tumor. So you want to do a marker, you want to do a pattern. But before you do that, there's somebody else who already has a pattern. It's a very tree, you know, very difficult thing to get a get a pattern for some mutation like that because you it's already known. And person who already had found it first, you have a claim on it. So this is this is very difficult. You to have an attorney run the pattern literature search. Now you can show an established in five clinics in your town and show that well every time this has worked that when there is a P53 mutation on a 249th codon I see that the patient has this kind of tumor or has a risk of developing this tumor. You prove that so many times and you go to the other patients and say this is my data you should do this and make them you know, their So in so, one of your slides you have mentioned that uh, in 2030 Cancer will be the leading cause of death. So, what are the possible reasons for this? Uh, the uh, the cancer because the thing is that uh, the the two reasons. One that the overall trend of cancer for the last 10, 15, 20 years is on the rise. It's, it keeps on increasing. People's habits have gone a little bit better, but they also gone for a lot of processed food. There is a lot of, uh, you know, junk food that people eat, a lot of dyes. So they know that their people are going to go into this, this, kind of, this kind of route. At the same time, there will be elimination, but then they will find some other things. So it's just a projection. It's just a hypothetical, you know, statement saying that the tumor is on the right. So by 2.30, uh, they, they projected that for the heart disease, they projected for the cancer, they said well it looks like cancer will take over heart disease by the problem therapy. So it's, I think it's projection, I don't think that there's hard proof for that. Then what should be the minimum sample which we should take to... Epidemiology uh, always requires large samples. As you know, they were like 10 and 20,000. Tamoxifen trial was 56,000 nurses. So they always require a very large sample. Like in our experiments we do, you know, we have... Uh, uh, you know, you do triplicates a couple of times and put error bar and you're done, right? But in this uh, epidemiological studies, that is one, one requirement. To make a really uh, good epidemiological study, you need a huge number of samples. So what do people do? So for example, you have uh, some uh, idea, or you're doing some epidemiological study for a compound, and you have 200 samples. So what, what they do is, then there will be like, you know, five other institutes that are doing. You combine the results and do meta-analysis. And meta-analysis is very popular in epidemiology. And then now, producing from 200, you have 5,000 samples. And then it gives you more validity to your data, more confidence, a lot of robustness, and good reason to get it published. And similarly, when we are doing the 
Most of the times, it will it will be published because uh, they realize that if you look like a thamic mice a study with a new mouse, which is very expensive. So people usually use a group of five, uh, like you know, we use group of five for the a thamic mouse study. Uh, for regular studies, for carcinogenesis uh, studies, we have fifteen. Like if you do a memory carcinogenesis study, we use 15 per, per group. Okay. And the toxicological studies, you use 10 per group. And the new mice, we do 5 per There is something. It's been documented somewhere that you should do like this. No, but the. Uh, no, you see, there is no. People will do. But you normally, when you do a laboratory studies, <laughs> I've never seen anybody doing more than 10-15 animals per group. Uh, people have done less. You know, you see, you do, um, but if you're like two or three, it's a little bit hard to begin the data. But if you're 10 or 15, it's easily believable. And you won't have any problem getting it published. Because we have to go through the academic process and then whenever there is a meeting, such meeting. They always say reduce the number of animals. Yeah, no, we have the same, we have the same issue. Uh, ethical, you know, biological, I mean, the animal, uh, animal IRB, the ethical reviews, I was, I was on the committee also. So you have to, you have to see the validity and look at the, you know, they, they will look at a lot of, you know, a lot of things to, to see. So the thing is that you also try to want to see that what is the percent inhibition you're expecting. So for example, you say that this compound is so good that not a single animal is going to develop tumor in the treatment group and all of them are going to develop tumor in the control group, well you can get by with five. But if you have a your margin is low, so it's just like a you know, it's just like a logical uh, you know, selection of the group size. regular health checks and they are going to miss. For example, in uh, in India, a long time ago, the health, your lung cancer incidence was pro pretty low. And I know that my my mother's grandfather, right, he died of uh, uh, having some sort of a problem, but he always had a problem with the, you know, with the lungs, like, you know. So now when I think, and he was a smoker, so when I think back, I bet hundred dollars that he died of lung cancer, but they didn't know he never went to the hospital. So those things can happen. So I'm sure that those areas that they select, they are selected by American Cancer Society. There is a huge data from the health centers. The data, the data is provided by the health centers. Yeah. So yeah. there is no health center. Some of the areas we have. Yeah. Then the, the, the misleading. Like people like threshold that are going and screening the population. Yes. Then coming out with the I think that the way, and you're right, I think that the, the thing, the, the negative part in the whole thing is that you really don't know uh, whether everybody who had an answer was accounted for in that, that region. 
it's quite possible that it's in some rural areas where people you know, don't go for regular health checks and things. Maybe people you know, had cancers and they, they died, but they never reported. So that green might become red, right? So now that's, it, I mean, that's, that's a valid point. <coughs> Okay, thank you everybody. See you tomorrow.